Hello everybody, you're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry, we play local unsigned and or independent music, and we catch up with Twangling Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for the Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk That's d-a-n-e dot c-o-b-a-i-n at wickhamsound.org.uk So this week we are going to be chatting to Suzanne Percy, also known as Squid Face Girl But before we do that we are going to head over to the Rye Light Zone And uh, we are going to be checking out some more of Black Solstice A Christmas themed horror story by myself, Dane Cobain He walked out of the living room and out into the hallway His footsteps falling silently with soft thup thup thups that didn't make an echo the hallway was dark, but that wasn't a problem for Satan Claus, who could hunt by smell just as easily as by sight. The floorboards creaked as he placed his weight on them, but the sound was swallowed up by the darkness. From above him, he could discern the subtle thumping of four heartbeats, two in each of the upstairs bedrooms. He drew his tongue across his lips, sending filthy, dead blood dribbling down his chin. He gnashed subconsciously at the air, just like his thralls when they chewed through their shrouds in their graves. The house was an unwelcoming place, packed to the rafters with the symbols of white magic. But Satan Claus was a hunter, and like all hunters, he reveled in the thrill of the chase. It would make his meal all the better. I'll have a black solstice without you. Elvis Deathly. The door to their bedroom seemed to open of its own accord. Then the darkness changed texture, and a figure stepped silently through the doorway. Satan Claus was dressed in robes of black, though they were trimmed with crimson. To the two girls who were still learning their relative scale, he looked ten feet tall, but that was impossible because it would have pushed his head through the ceiling and up towards the roof, where his sleigh was still perched precariously, his hellhounds scrabbling their claws across the tiles and sending them, crashing them down to the floor. Oh, 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 Satan Claus growled, his voice sounding like the rattle of a corpse as it swung in the breeze at a medieval crossroads. Merry solstice. He held his dark hand up and tensed it into a fist, sending a ripple of evil washing over the room like the fog from a smoke machine. The candles in the window, which symbolised that Christ was the light of the world, were extinguished by a wave of black wind. The vampire's psychokinetic energy erupted outwards like a sonic boom, except it was visible as it passed through the darkness. A fierce wind blew through the building, detonating the girl's nativity scene and sending the baby Jesus flying through the air and into the wall, where he shattered. The China models had been valuable family heirlooms, passed down from generation to generation, but within the space of a couple of seconds, they'd been turned into nothing more than a pile of brightly painted broken pottery. Outside, in the garden, the snowman's head exploded, its cold eyes firing through the night and into the windows of the girls' bedroom, sending shards of glass scattering across their stuffed toys and all over the floor. And in the bedroom, the two girls looked imperiously out from their bunks. The vampire had protruding teeth and an aquiline nose, as well as the hungry look of a man who hadn't eaten for a year. As he looked at the girls, his gaze alone was enough to freeze them to their beds, as though they were trapped between wakefulness and unconsciousness in a satanic sleep paralysis. He took a step towards the girls and then another. Get away from my kids, you make-believe The vampire's head turned in a full semicircle, taking in Mildred Reed in her nightdress and her husband a step and a half behind her. She had a wooden stake in one hand and a hammer in the other, and she was rushing towards him like a woman possessed. The sharpened wood was closing in on him, but the vampire was too fast for it, clicking his fingers and dissolving into a whirling cloud of bats, which dodged the woman's jabs and batted against her, their little legs getting tangled up in her hair. John swatted ineffectively at them, while Mildred continued to swing the stake through the air at a target that no longer existed. In their beds, the girls came back to life again, their innocent bodies no longer pinned in place by the vampire's evil eye. They moved towards their stockings. There was a growl from the darkness in the hallway and then Tupac was in the room too. A black cat battling black bats. But the bats were fighting back and the cat was howling. Its unnatural yowl seemed to break the spell and the room flooded with volume as everyone tried to move at once. Satan claws reformed, the bats disappearing beneath his robes while John and Mildred made a rush for him. The girls were at the feet of their beds, rummaging through their stockings for the gifts within. Jude was the quickest and she tore the wrapping from what looked like a bottle of perfume before raising it in both arms. Satan Claus took the hit of holy water straight in the face. Well, tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. Band-aids over puncture holes. Oh, 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 Satan Claus growled. Is that the best you can do? Time stood still around him. 
Jude was still holding the bottle in front of her face, visible mostly as a pair of bright green eyes in the darkness. Jessie was in the bunk below, her hands still buried deep within her stocking. Satan Claus was in the middle of the room with his back to the door, while Tupac had bolted for the floor beneath the bed and was watching proceedings unfold with the disinterested wariness of the common house cat. John and Mildred were to either side of the vampire, their hammers raised in the air as they fumbled with their stakes, and Lilith was standing in the doorway. She was like Satan Claus but with style, a biblical beauty who'd added flavour over time like a fine wine. Her husband was unkempt for a vampire, with flowing white hair, a bushy beard and a big belly. Lilith looked like she took care of herself, like she worked out every night lifting the lids off crypts or doing gothic lunges. She was dressed mostly in velvet with a few hints of leather, and her lips and fingernails were painted the deep scarlet of an aged bottle of O negative. Enough of this, husband, Lilith said, clapping her hands together. When her palms touched, the two adults were thrown against opposite walls of the bedroom, where they smacked against the walls and then slid to the floor in a broken symmetry. Let's feed. Like hell, John growled, pushing himself up on one knee before slumping back down again. Blood was flowing freely from somewhere on his scalp, and his wife was unconscious but breathing. My good man, Satan Claus said, I have no desire to hurt you or your wife. I remember you as a child. You used to write me letters every solstice, begging me not to take you or your brothers. His mouth fell open. All we want is to feed, Lilith said, her voice floating eerily on the supernatural wind that was still blowing through the house, setting ornaments tumbling to the floor and rotating crucifixes where they hung above the doorways. But they're my daughters. So, Satan Claus replied, leering evilly at him, you planned a solstice dinner tomorrow, did you not? John Reed said nothing. Yes, husband, Lilith added, they have a turkey defrosting in the refrigerator. But that's different, John protested. Is it? Satan Claus growled. It died so you could live. How is this any different? It just... Mr. Reed, I grow tired of talking to you, Satan Claus said. Don't make me kill you. After all, alive you can make new children. Dead, you're no good to anyone. You... I'll... It's okay, Daddy, Jude said, her voice sounding eerily calm amidst the chaos. I know what we have to do. Yes, Jessie agreed. It's the only way. Girls, I don't... Yes, Lilith said. It's as it should be. She clicked her fingers and the girl's leather-bound Bible flew off their bookcase and towards their father's head. It knocked him clean out and he snoozed on in silence like his wife while the vampires moved in on the two girls. They offered no resistance. That was the latest instalment of Black Solstice by myself, Dane Cobain, for this week's entry into the Rylight Zone. You can check out previous episodes of the show to catch more of that story. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Nick Coleman with Python. Who blasts that beast 
was My Best Friend by Squid Face Girl. And before that, we had Python by Nick Coleman. You're listening to the Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm joined in conversation now by this week's guest, who is Suzanne Percy, also known as Squid Face Girl. So the first question may or may not be relevant to you, but this is my traditional opening question. I ask everybody. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Um, the last book I read was probably The Travel Guide to Goa that I got in a charity <laughs> shop, which is a bit old hat, really, because everybody just looks at the internet, don't they, on YouTube. Um, so um, that was actually the last book I looked at. To say I read it from cover to cover would be a lie, but I did... Um, yeah. Hunt down and Juna, which is the area that I'm going to in India. Yeah, that's that's cool. I mean, I I do the same when I travel. I like to have a travel book as well, even though again I'll look on TripAdvisor, but I tend to flick through the travel book as well. Um, but you say you got it from a charity shop as well, so that was quite a lucky find, right? That you found specifically the area that you're going to. Yeah, there it was. It was fate. fate. It was meant to be, so I couldn't help it. Yeah. But that always happens when I go in a charity shop. There's always something that I pick up that I didn't necessarily go in for. Yeah, no, I know that feeling. Cool. And so you you mentioned to me you're off to India literally this evening at the time of at the time of us having this call. Um, That's why correct. are you heading to India? Is it is it for for work? Is it for pleasure? What can you uh, tell us about your trip? It's totally for pleasure. Um, I went two weeks earlier last year at the end of um, November for the first time. So it's my second uh, journey to India. And the reason I'm going is because my girlfriend is passionate about the place and has visited six mm -hmm. or seven times and has work uh, in India as well. So she goes there every year for work yeah. and then we both go for pleasure, you know, to get away from the cold here. I was going to say, I assume she's going with you because otherwise that would be mean if you went without her. Uh, well, there's a party of six of us going and her son is already ah. there. So it's going to be quite a party. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So obviously the reason I want to chat to you today is about your music. Um, and so I guess the best place to start is if you just tell us how long you've been making music and where you got your start. OK. Um, I mean, I was a musical kid, as in I had a Casio Tone MT65 mm -hmm. in 1982 and I wrote my own songs under the name of a person called Bai Su. And then I turned that into a squiggle way before Prince ever did. Um, so I was a symbol uh, yeah. in my teens yeah. and I wrote songs then. But then um, fast forward to about 1996 and um, my best friend Derek, who I met, sorry, I'd have to go back to 1989. I met my best friend Derek yeah. when I was 19 or 20. And um, I met under the guise of being a session singer for his music. And we did our first recordings in an eight-track studio, Real to Real. Um, the first song I ever sung was one of his called Living Now, which was about the breaking down of the Berlin Wall, which was very oh. current at that time. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then my brother, we weren't, you know, there's three years between me and my older brother, Andrew. Um, and he moved out, went and lived in Cheltenham. And um, me and Derek went to visit him and um, he was in a band and had a little Tascam four track uh, tape sort of uh, recording device. And we started making music on that together. And we either my brother would come back to High Wickham or I'd go up to see him with Derek. And we did that for about a decade and a half. And it all culminated in a performance at Bucks New Uni in 2008 for a talent. Yeah competition called Box Got Talent which we won um, and then we awesome. got two days recording in the uni as the prize and re-recorded one of our tracks with a little bit more oomph you know what I mean yeah. so that was a great yeah. experience and then life just pulled us in completely opposite directions Derek moved up to Scotland my best friend Andrew got married and had children and I stayed in with him and became quite depressed and um and then recovered and suddenly decided 15 years later that I wanted to do some digital music again. But of course, yeah. technology had moved on, but we hadn't necessarily <laughs> fell up in Scotland without even internet connection, except what's on his phone. So he would literally record a song from the monitor of his equipment into his phone and email it to me. And I yeah. would try and lay that on a track in garage bands until we had a whole song. And then I'd sing on it. and. Um, the results were astounding considering the, 
the um, nature by which they were recorded. And I thought, no, we've got to perform these. It's a shame to put all this effort in and not go somewhere with them. So in September, we got a slot at HMV in High Wycombe and we sung them all. And then we followed that up with a few gigs in Brighton. Um, and then he had to go back to Scotland. So performing live is quite difficult logistically with me yeah. currently on yeah. the South Coast and him in Scotland. But it yeah. works. We, we do make music that way. Um, more recently, because that project of us performing live, that was the ultimate goal this year, it's it's taught me how to use garage bands a little bit. So I've been experimenting yeah. with a few of my own solo projects since then. And that's kind of cool. where I'm at. Yeah. Well, and I suppose that makes the um, your live performances more special in a way because, you know, they're not something that you're doing three or four of each week. You know, they, they're more Absolutely. of an event. Absolutely. It's really a bit of a wing and a prayer. Um, but they seem to work. You know, I, I was very proud of our performances, all three of them this year. So, yeah. yeah. And we plan to do awesome. it again next year with a heap of new songs because we just cool. don't seem to be able to stop yeah, writing new stuff. Well, and one of my questions was, like, what are some of the venues you'd love to play next year? bit cheeky, but if I'm honest, I'd, I'd like to be more um, vocal in High Wycombe. So okay. a, a pop at the um, Frog Fest stage would be the ultimate goal. Yep, mm. yep. Cool. Awesome. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about the tunes? You know, you've, you've, you've sent me a bunch, so we're going to be playing a bunch <laughs> over the next few shows anyway. Um, but Fantastic. You out Thank three, you so much. You, you, oh, no, no problem. No problem. But, but you picked out three specifically that we're playing in, in this week's show. Can you tell us a little bit about each of them? And also, I suppose the mission behind them, because <laughs> you your songs tend to be, I don't want to say like political, but they tend to have a mission. They have a purpose, you know. So can you tell us a little bit about each one? Certainly I can. Um, I think the first one I sent you, I've called the suicide song. It's actually called semi colon, never full stop. I understand the semicolon to be a sort of symbol of hope for mm -hmm. people that feel hopeless. Um, and so I incorporated that into the lyrics of the song. Um, and I hear you about my song choices being having quite a purpose behind them. I would really love to highlight the importance of being kind to yourself, of talking to one another or seeking specialist support and reaching mm -hmm. out if you feel so hopeless that you might contemplate to take your own life. And if I can do any good with this song by highlighting um, the importance of being kind to yourself and talking to someone. And yeah, that, that's kind of where that one's coming from. Yeah. Um, but genuinely, that's a kind of new squid face solo thing and they just seem to these um songs and the lyrics are coming from within i think for decades i generally wrote about love and love yeah. that was lost and feeling quite depressed and hopeless and things being a bit twisted so it's really nice to have a new approach to to music yeah. and to telling more topical tales um so that's the first song semicolon never full stop yeah and what about, what about the other two? Okay, so I also chose a song that was uh, 10 years old, but with a backlog of over 30 years that nobody's heard, I figured I could kind of go anywhere. And I thought it was important to highlight my songwriting uh, uh, would, wouldn't exist without uh, the people incorporated in the second song, which is called My Best Friend. And it is dedicated to my best friend, Derek, who happens mm -hmm. to be the giant obstacle and the musical brains behind most of the electronic music that was current this year and everything else for the past 20 years but this one specifically was actually uh, played and the music written by my brother Andrew who has also been an absolute um, amazing part of my musical journey without these two guys yeah. I wouldn't be here being musical and now with the courage to go it alone so I wanted to highlight the song my best friend about my best friend Derek. The story behind mm. the song is actually um, somebody was rather jealous of of my extremely close friendship with Derek. He, he's yeah, in my left arm. You know, he, he he's he's just always been there for me, always got my back. And so 
um, somebody was quite jealous about that friendship, and um, this was the outcome, was this song. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM, Welcome Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Suzanne Percy, a.k.a. Squid Face Girl. And this is Squid Face Girl with Semicolon Never Full Stop. That was Semicolon Never Full Stop by Squid Face Girl. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And I'm joined here in conversation now by this week's guest, who is Suzanne Percy, also known as Squid Face Girl. Cool. And then find and the song third, I... uh, yeah. And this, this is the one that's, is the, this the one that's in aid of uh, Alzheimer's awareness? Well, I hope it, one? to raise awareness about Alzheimer's and to highlight um, Alzheimer's as a very current thing. Um, mm -hmm. This song's got quite a festive twist to it, so it's really so well placed that I can play it before Christmas. Yeah. Um, the story behind it is a very personal one. Um, my rock, my mother, has been um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and that seemed um, like a long journey getting the diagnosis. Yeah, I realised last year when we went round for our our um, 
Boxing Day dinner that there were no mince pies and no chocolate yeah. cake. And these are standard staples that my mum does every year. Her pastry is to die for. My friends will vouch for this. I have a friend, Jenny, who gets mince pies every year from my mum. And there were none. And I knew it was because she couldn't do that anymore. Yeah. And this year I felt it was important that she handed down the mantle of how to make that pastry to her daughter. And I arranged yeah. to go there. Um, I arrived on said date at said time. She wasn't really sure why I was there, but we got all the ingredients out, rustled through them, weighed them up about eight times. I thought this is going to be long going. But once she got rolling, she she taught me how to make the mince pies. And the, the last song is called There'll Be Mince Pies This Christmas, and it's dedicated to my mum. And if I can raise money once I work out how for yeah, the outsiders. Yeah. Um, cause or research for a cure i would love to do that but um that might have to wait till next christmas as it is quite a topically christmas yes. song Men mention of mince pies and i'm out of time to know how to do that right now yeah but if anyone hears yeah. it and feels inclined to donate to alzheimer's please do Thank well you and, so and as you say and, and as you say, I think it's important to have that conversation and to and to have that dialogue as a as a society as well. And I think if we can, you know, it's almost, you know, Christmas is a, is actually quite a good time to have those those kind of dialogues because it is so much about family and about you know appreciation appreciating what you've got. Um, and so I think it's important to have those kinds of conversations, especially at this time of Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the underlying message of my Alzheimer's um, song is that my mummy can't remember what she had for breakfast, mm -hmm. but we can talk about the past quite cohesively at this moment. Um, she's not in very late stages. And I can enjoy every moment that I spend with my mum even yeah. if she doesn't remember them in those moments, we're having a wonderful time. And yeah. um, it's very important for me psychologically to have those moments with my mum whilst we're still able to. Uh, yeah. And I wish I could have done it more when she was able to remember. And that message screams out in the song as well. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you about the name. So what's behind the name Squid Face Girl? <laughs> Oh, in about 1996, um, Derek lived with one of his best friends, Paul, and his rather feisty wife had a row with her husband and shouted out, you're such a squid face boy or something like that. And it just amused me at the age of uh, <laughs> 20 something back then. Um, and so I started calling Derek squid face boy and it stuck. Yeah. It just stuck. So that one of our incarnations um, was actually in 2000, I think, we called ourselves Squid Face for a while, way before yeah. Squid Games, you know. But um, yeah, Dale and yeah. I almost fell out over it when we decided to reform this year. He was determined not to be called Squid Face anymore because yeah. of the current Squid Game phenomenon. He just felt it wasn't apt. And I, on the other hand, was determined not to lose 20 years of my history. <laughs> Mm -hmm. by dispensing with the name. So I had to become Squid Face Girl. It was as simple as that. And uh, yeah. and he's such a pain up my... that I, After much deliberation, his name was to be and will ever forever now be the giant obstacle. Um, so it's a huge mouthful. But I'm, I'm Squid Face Girl, and I have been Squid Face Girl. Well, yeah. part of Squid Face, our Squid Face, for 20-odd years. So I was determined not to lose that. Yeah. Well, and honestly, I, the, you know, the link to Squid Games or whatever, it, it hadn't occurred to me, you know, so. and I'll No, we should we could have it, been Squid doesn't... Face. We could have stayed. Yeah. Don't start me on that, Dane. <laughs> yeah, no, I won't. No. <laughs> awesome. So, and we, we, we talked a little bit about, a bit about mental health earlier. And one of the questions I quite like to ask, especially musicians um, who have dealt with mental health issues, uh, how important do you think uh, music and particularly live music is to uh, to people's mental health? Um, I, it's very important, Dane. For me, I can only speak from a personal point of view um, and say that I have my recording equipment out the back in the garage and I spend several hours and evening out there making beats or singing 
or just mm-hmm. listening. And it, the pride I f- get filled with if I listen to my back catalogue sounds a bit egotistic, but it really lifts me to think if I'm in a low place and I listen to one of the songs that I've done or a video of a performance I did, it makes me feel more worthwhile, if that makes sense. Um, uh, it's that feeling yeah. of accomplishment. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. Um, and that can be at any level, hey, whether it's properly just in front of family or in front of yourself, of a recording you've made, just you and the camera, or, you know, perhaps you're brave enough to try an open mic or a performance, you know, in a pub. And that's yeah. where the buzz is as well, you know, the feeling of kind of, wow, just did that. That was me. when you, And um, it's a real natural euf- euphoria um and as someone who seeks euphoria in very unnatural places yeah. I, I can only say that nothing really beats the thrill of uh of, of accomplishment of having pulled it off with a back catalog that's 30 years long there's there's much to be heard and i just feel like yeah. now with the onset of this technology the internet the interweb yeah. that I, now I is the time for it yeah, I've been toying with silly videos and um, they yeah. are purely just to show a sense of fun. Um, but I won't stop because also I enjoy that immensely as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, and like musically speaking, who would you say are some of your biggest musical influences? Um, I'm a product of the 70s and I grew up in the 80s, Dane. And some might say that some of the music from the 80s was a bit like the cesspit of the 80s. And unfortunately, I'm a victim of some of that music, but not all. Um, so there is some Stock Aitken and Waterman in my collection. And I'm quite proud to be a Rick Astley fan back in the day. Um, but I'm more proud to have been there at the onset of Electronica, really. And there's a lot of Depeche Mode, a lot of Alison Moyer, uh, Yazoo, a lot of everything but the girl in my back catalogue of 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 influential artists, female Annie Lennox. Um, yeah. And my upbringing in Wickham uh, led me to blues parties and a lot of reggae and a very influential uh, female artist called Sandra Cross introduced to me in the late 80s meant that I'm also very much a fan of a uh, lover's rock style of reggae and the female artists there. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, just a couple more questions. One of them I wanted to, to ask, like, are there any plans? Are there any plans in the in the works for, say, like an, an EP or an album for Squid Face Girl? Oh, there certainly is, but um, being on the other side of 50, the technology and the need to involve other people it would be paramount for that to happen. So um, I'd love to work out how to do that. Um, but that's a project definitely for next year. I need to set myself targets, and I think you've just helped me work out what it is, would be to yeah. possibly get something like that off the ground by the summer would be wonderful and then be able to perform it and promote it i mean i see so much wonderful stuff on the local um pages about how musicians do that um and i've made a few nice connections this year so i just need to work out how you do it and and do it you know and that's one of my messages really is you're not (laughs) never too old to have another go if for whatever reason you know something knocked you down try to get back up um yeah i'm here currently having another go um yeah after a, like a you know 15 year sabbatical really yeah and and even not even have another go you know it's never too late to try and pick up a new That's skill it. you know never if somebody's never made music before it's you know why why not i would recommend it to anyone really yeah and if you're good with technology embrace it <laughs> yeah awesome cool and just to end on so uh and we just kind of covered this a little bit but but what's next for you and where can people follow you to stay up to date and to find out more oh thanks um i hadn't anticipated plugging myself um well i do have a youtube um channel and it's squid face girl all in lowercase with no space squid face girl um and you should be able to find it squid face girl and the giant obstacle would be another alias um yeah. i also have a facebook 
page, which is called Squid Face Girl Music, and a SoundCloud page, yep. which is Squid Face Girl, and an Instagram page, which is also Squid Face Girl. So basically, Squid Face Girl in lowercase with no space should should you should find yep. me uh, if you Google that somehow. Yeah. Big thank you to Suzanne Percy for joining me. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Welcome Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. And this is the Mince Pie Song by Squid Face Girl. So sad but true Can't change the hand life dealt you My mommy, mommy dear You don't know it now, but I do I only wish I could Have made you proud of me When you were still you
That was Chains by Jake Coop. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Oak Shed now to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. The Shadows, 20 Golden Greats, an LP I bought from the Florence Nightingale charity shop in Aylesbury for a pound. I just about remember pop music before the Beatles. Us little kiddies had the TV to ourselves once the test card had finished just before five. We had a nice lady called Muriel Young who spoke to glove puppets called Ollie Beak and Fred Barker. And sometimes Bert Weedham would show us his guitar and what he could do with it. I went to infant school play dates where each home had a big gramophone, a solid piece of furniture. There would be very few LPs, but there was usually Rock Around the Clock and something by Cliff Richard and the Shadows. Hank Marvin was Britain's first guitar hero, if you don't count Burt Whedon, but he was also the first sidekick. He was Cliff Richard's on-stage best mate and comedy partner. Hank also had his own sidekick, Bruce Welsh, the rhythm guitarist. Welsh's strum patterns are essential to the Shadows' effect, I once had to do Rhythm on Apache and it was not as easy as Bruce Welsh made it look. Hank Marvin is still an icon, rhyming slang for excessively hungry and recognisable as much for his glasses as his vibrato. The Shadows were characters in the Cliff Richard films. Hank and Bruce acted alongside Melvin Hayes and Una Stubbs, all going on a summer holiday. This was all massive in the early 60s. But the Shadows lived a double life, they were pop stars in their own right. 
They wore the sharp suits expected of light entertainers and they had their own choreographed moves. Those great wooden gramophones of my infant years would often have a stack of singles and there would always be some shadows. Great instrumentals with a solid bass, drums and rhythm guitar topped off with Hank's precise fluid melodic lead all played with his distinctive tone and twang. These ranged from the almost primal tribal Apache to the one I best remember from the time, Wonderful Land, a gorgeous tune that I still find uplifting. It has a string arrangement that makes it sound like the theme to an epic movie, and it has a staccato section with a perfect echo effect bringing it back down to rock and roll earth. Later in the 60s I would collect Jumble for the Scouts, and there were always shadow singles which we played on the big wooden gramophone in the scout hut. I remember Dance On and Contiki, instrumentals that still sounded great when the other early 60s records sounded dated, probably more dated in the late 60s than they do now. And there was the rise and fall of Fingal Bunt, basically a 12-bar jam but with a catchy hook, and it almost seemed current, in the late 60s blues boom. Hank and Bruce went on to sing real songs, but possibly inspired by the shadows, other guitarists went on to make some really good instrumentals, like Sabre Dance by Love Sculpture, Albatross by Fleetwood Mac, and Beck's Bolero by Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page. However, by the early 70s, I had discovered Santana, the hippie Latin Hank Marvin. 20 Golden Greats, The Shadows. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for joining me. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. As always, you can listen to us again. We are repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. You can also get in touch with me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And you can find us on Facebook if you search for the Arch on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune for this week, uh, <laughs> which is a very apt one. This is Chill and Groove with Tune In. I'll catch you next week. I want to tune in to your station. What's on your frequency? Want to connect? If you just let me, I wanna know what gives you that feeling. Maybe one day you can dance in my kitchen. Tune in. I wanna tune in. Tune in. I wanna tune in to your station. Tune in digital when I